Hello, everyone. Uh, today we have a really interesting show with, in my view, one of the outstanding members of the Biden administration, uh, and that is Lena Khan, who is the chair of the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. Uh, my suspicion is that 90% of the American people know very little about what the FTC does and certainly what the many accomplishments of Chair Khan have been. So that's what I want to go over. But before we do that, I want to say a few words about the overall economic climate, which makes Lena's work so important. Uh, in my view, uh, we have an unprecedented level of income and wealth inequality in America, uh, where three people on top own more wealth than the bottom half of American society. That's a real problem. But in addition to that, and what is not talked about very often, is the extraordinary concentration of ownership, which we are seeing in sector after sector after sector, whether it is transportation, whether it's agriculture, whether it's media, whether it's big tech, whatever it may be. And so today we'll be discussing what that concentration of ownership means to you in terms of uh, the kind of bills and costs that you experience, what it means to you as a worker. So those are some of the issues we're going to get into. Uh, but let me begin by asking uh, Chair Khan, so how does one become uh, the chair of the FTC? Who do you have to know to do that? Well, first of all, let me just say it's so great to be here with you. Uh, you've just been such a fearless champion for working families in America and especially at a time where too many people feel that they can't get a fair shake, uh, showing people that the government is fighting for them is just absolutely critical. Um, so the Federal Trade Commission was created over a century ago. This was in the first Gilded Age where you had the robber barons like the Steel Trust, the Meat Trust, that had accumulated an enormous amount of power. And these businesses were using that power to squeeze Americans, to harm Americans, hiking prices, cutting wages, squeezing small businesses. And so Congress created the FTC to make sure that there would be a government agency that could fight back against that corporate abuse and protect Americans from monopolization, from tricks in the marketplace, and from business tactics that are unfairly allowing firms to get ahead at the expense of the public. And so we enforce the nation's antitrust laws and the nation's consumer protection laws. All right. What does that mean? You would enforce anti, we all have heard the expression antitrust, right? And some of us remember back in the fourth grade, the Sherman antitrust, the Clayton antitrust. So what does all that mean in English? So the essence of it is that Congress decided that competition is better than monopolies. The idea being that if you have choice, if you can choose among companies, be it as a customer, be it as a worker, then those companies have to compete to get your business. And that competition between them incentivizes them to lower their prices, to raise wages, and to generally make products better. In contrast, if you allow companies to merge and eliminate that competition, they know that you're stuck and they can get away with mistreating you. They can raise the prices, they can cut your wages, they can squeeze businesses out of the marketplace, and they know that people can't vote with their feet because there aren't options in the right. marketplace. All right. My impression, and I think the impression of many Americans, is there has not been on the part of either Democratic or Republican administrations until very recently, thank you, uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of activity, uh, antitrust activity. Is that a fair statement? There's no doubt that during the Reagan administration, there was a very clear set of policy decisions made that it would be better for government to roll back, to take a very hands-off approach, to allow waves of mergers and acquisitions, to allow markets to consolidate. And 40 years on, we're living with the consequences of that. I mean, as you noted, market after market in the United States has consolidated. So where 30 years ago you had dozens of companies, now you just have a handful or even one. Right. That's true in areas like airlines, like telecom, across food and agriculture, but even in areas like 
laundry detergent. If you go to the grocery store, you might see 25 kinds of brands, but in reality, they're just owned by two companies. That's and if you have cable television, and you might have hundreds of channels and think you're hearing a hundred different points of view, in fact, are owned, end up being owned by just a handful of very large media conglomerates, et cetera, et cetera. Correct? That's right, an enormous amount of consolidation of power and ownership. Okay, let me jump into, let's get away from the general and get into some specifics. Uh, all over this country, people are sick and tired of paying the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. Uh, in some cases, we pay 10, 20 times more for the same exact product sold abroad. My committee, the Health Education Labor Committee, has been working on this. You have been working on this. Uh, you have been dealing with something called the Orange Book. You're one of three people in America who knows what the Orange Book is. What have you been doing? What is the Orange Book? How does that have to do with manipulating the patent system, et cetera? The Orange Book is this obscure repository <laughs> of patents. And what it means is if a big pharma company lists their patent in the Orange Book, they can automatically block competition. They can keep generics out of the market. This is a new development, right? They so-called. Yes, a new development. Say there's um, a new company on the market that wants to offer the same drug but at a lower price, right. at a cheaper price. So what would a, a pharmaceutical company do to prevent that? They can list in the, pat, in the orange book their patent um, in a way that will block that newer, cheaper company from coming onto the market. And what our team at the FTC found was that there are all sorts of medical products that have been around for decades. Take the inhaler, the asthma inhaler. Over 40 million Americans rely on asthma inhalers. These inhalers have been around since the 1950s. And in America, people routinely pay over $500 for an inhaler, even though in other countries, consumers are paying as little as $20. And so our team took a close look. Let me look. interrupt you. Everybody hear that? $500, $20. Continue. Our team took a close look and we believed that one reason companies were able to do this is because they were listing bogus patents in the Orange Book. And so last fall, we sent them letters saying we think these patents are illegitimately listed. Um, under your leadership, the Senate Help Committee uh, also made clear to these asthma, uh, manufac asthma inhaler manufacturers that there may have been some patent tricks going on. And as a result, a whole set of these companies, three of the four manufacturers recently announced that they're either delisting these patents and are gonna cap how much Americans pay out of pocket to no more than $35, which is pretty remarkable, but also quite troubling that it took so long to get here and that for years, Americans have been paying inflated prices for these essential products. Well I, I'm sure you have heard from people all over this country, asthma is a very serious issue, COPD, very serious issue. People need these uh, inhalers in order to stay alive. And as you've indicated, people are paying outrageous prices, and I'm glad we were able to at least deal with three out of the four. We're working on the fourth, that's Teva, and we'll see what we can do with them. But we do have, as of June 1st, two out of the three will be announcing, putting, implementing policies, no more than $35 at your pharmacy. Uh, uh, GlaxoSmithKline will take a little bit longer. All right, let me go to why we're on prescription drugs, an issue of concern to me. A lot of talk about uh, pharmacy benefit managers, PBMs. You're working on that as well. We are. All right, what are you doing there? So pharmacy benefit managers are, again, these obscure players, uh, but basically they're these middlemen. So they determine who gets access to what medicines and at what price. And we- Back that up, I mean, that's an extraordinary statement. Who gets access to, a one would assume, <clears throat> right, that all of us have access, right, it's the marketplace, all of us would have access to all of the great drugs that are on the market, right? Not the case? Not the case. I mean, what these PBMs help determine is when you go to the pharmacy, what medicines can you access at the pharmacy? And we have been hearing at the FTC a whole set of complaints. One of these complaints is that the medicines that are made available at the pharmacy 
are not the most affordable medicines for Americans, but it's actually the medicines on which the PBMs are getting the biggest kickback from the drug manufacturer. Technical term is rebate, but I like Technical your term Technical term is rebate. <laughs> Some people say these may be kickbacks, which is a really troubling allegation because the whole point of our drug system is supposed to be that once patents expire, cheaper generics are supposed to come onto the market. And once they're on the market, Americans are supposed to be able to get access to those Is that generics. how it's supposed to work? That's how it's supposed oh, to work. I'm only chairman of the committee. I didn't know. No. <laughs> of course, it doesn't work like that. There's massive amounts of lack of transparency, price manipulation. It is a very, very broken system. And so we've heard concerns that even once you have these generics on the market, that when Americans go to the pharmacy, they only have access to the expensive branded version and not the generics. And one reason, some people say, is because of some of these rebates and kickbacks at the PBM. So we at the FTC are scrutinizing that. The other set of concerns we've heard is that these PBMs may be squeezing independent pharmacies. And so these PBMs over the last few decades have both horizontally consolidated, so three major PBMs now control over 80% of the market, but they've also what's known as vertically integrated. So they now have merged with health insurers, and they also now have their own mail order pharmacies. And so we hear from independent pharmacies that that creates a conflict of interest because you have your community pharmacies that are now dependent on these PBMs, but they're also competing with them. And so we hear that PBMs sometimes impose all sorts of arbitrary fees on independent pharmacies. I was just in Philadelphia the other week meeting with local pharmacists, and they were sharing some of them have been in business for decades, but they're on the cusp of going bankrupt. Yep. And of these pharmacy deserts emerging in local communities because some of these tactics and potentially coercive practices by the PBM. So we at the FTC, we a couple of years ago announced a public inquiry into this. Uh, we have that investigation ongoing, and in the coming weeks and months, we'll be able to share publicly what we've been doing on that. Okay, this is enormously important work. Um, unbelievably, one out of four Americans cannot afford uh, to purchase the uh, prescriptions that doctors prescribe. And that is insane. And, you know, it has a lot to do with the greed of the pharmaceutical industry. Also, I think the manipulations of PBM. So thank you for what you're doing uh, in that area. All right, let me get to a whole other issue, which is fascinating. Uh, and this is the non-compete clauses. All right, everybody know what a non-compete clause is? All right, Lena will tell you. What is a non-compete clause? So a non-compete clause is a provision in a lot of people's employment contracts that basically says, even once you leave your current job, for a certain number of years, you cannot go work for a competitor. And these clauses started off in the boardroom, mostly applying to executives, but in decades they've proliferated. And so you have fast food workers. All right, stop now. Fast food worker. I'm not talking about the CEO of a major company now. You're talking about a fast food worker is what? Prohibited from going to another fast food worker? Exactly. Fast food, fast food workers, security guards, janitors. All right, everybody understand what you're saying. You work hypothetically, at McDonald's, flipping hamburgers, and you what, prohib prohibited from going to Burger King across the street? That's right, you could say for five years, you can't go work for a competitor within a particular And this area. because you're gonna to reveal top secrets to the Burger King? There are a whole set of arguments the companies make, including that they need to protect trade secrets, that they can't allow sensitive, competitive information to be disclosed. How sensitive is flipping hamburgers? So look, I think especially in some of these areas, it's, it's difficult to see what a legitimate justification is. But interestingly, we've seen these crop up all sorts of places. So last year, the FTC proposed to ban non-compete clauses in the vast majority of employment contracts. We got over 22,000 comments, including not just from your fast food workers and your security guards, but also from doctors, from nurses, from engineers. How does uh, it work? With, I'm a nurse at a hospital. What, what do I have to sign? You have to sign a contract that limits you from leaving and working for a competing hospital. 
And we actually heard from some healthcare workers that during the pandemic, when over a period of weeks and months, the pandemic was flaring up in different parts of a particular state and doctors wanted to go where their help was most needed. But in practice, some doctors were not able to do so because of the non-competes. And so we've seen that these non-competes hurt workers. Uh, our team estimated that collectively, American workers' wages are up to $300 billion less than they would be if you didn't have these non-competes. We also hear that this is bad for small businesses because oftentimes if a business wants to enter a market and grow, they might not be able to hire relevant workers because they're all locked up by the existing big companies. What is the status of your investigation? So we proposed a rule, we got thousands of comments. Our team has been um, reviewing these comments and in the coming weeks, we'll be able to share how we're finalizing that rule. Um, let's talk about our friends at Amazon. All right. You uh, have filed uh, an antitrust lawsuit against Amazon. Why did you do that? So our lawsuit alleges that Amazon has illegally maintained its monopoly through a set of unlawful tactics. And stepping back, one way that you can tell when a company has become a monopoly that's abusing its monopoly power is when it's able to get away with harming its customers. And we've seen that Amazon has been harming both the shoppers that use the platform as well as the small businesses that sell through it. Just to give you an example, over the recent years, Amazon has been steadily hiking the fees that businesses have to pay to sell through Amazon so that now some businesses have to pay one out of every two dollars, which is basically a 50% monopoly tax wow. that they have to pay to Amazon. Similarly, our team uncovered that Amazon has been using secret algorithms that are actually inflating the prices that regular Americans are paying to the tune of a billion dollars. And so our lawsuit alleges that Amazon is able to only do that because they've used illegal tactics that prevent sellers from actually going to rival platforms and listing a lower price. So this is a lawsuit that we filed last year and it's currently ongoing. When you say currently ongoing, what does that mean? It's in the courts now? It's in the courts, um, so we'll have some hearings coming up in the months ahead. Uh, I think a lot of Americans concerned about the price of food. They walk into a grocery store, food prices are very high. I think it's fair to say that in the last couple of years since the pandemic, the food industry has made huge profits. Uh, and we have seen consolidation in that industry as well. Uh, you are involved, or at least an investigation, of Kroger's merger to buy Albertsons, a $25 billion deal, is that correct? So That's what's, right. What's that about? So um, the FTC recently filed a lawsuit to block Kroger's attempt to buy Albertsons, um, which, as you noted, would have been the largest grocery merger in American history. And the lawsuit is currently pending, but the complaint alleges that if the merger were to go through, Americans would be paying more at the grocery store uh, for staples like eggs and bread and milk, and that workers would also be making less because they would have less bargaining power. All right, do you want to say a little bit more? What's, why, the, why are the food prices going up? How does that have to do with uh, the monopoly, m monopolization of the food industry? So in food and agriculture, like in so many other parts of the economy, we've seen decades of consolidation. And so be it at the grocery store level, be it at the meat packer level, you've seen us go from a market where you have dozens of companies to now a market where you just have a very small number of companies. Take even an area like chicken farming. Chicken farming, you have thousands of farmers, millions of consumers, but they're just connected by four chicken processor companies. And what that means in practice is that if you're a chicken farmer, your entire livelihood can be dependent on a single company, which gives that company enormous power to cut how much they're paying you, to impose all sorts of abusive conditions, and what we've seen is that farmers are making less, consumers are paying more, 
and it's these middlemen that are capturing a larger and larger share of the overall price. Okay. Um, let's chat for a moment about junk fees. What is a junk fee? A junk fee is one of these hidden, deceptive surprise charges that pops up at the oftentimes at the very end of when you're looking to make a transaction. So say you're looking to buy an online ticket. You see the price is $40. You go try to buy that ticket. And when you're looking to check out, you would suddenly see that there's a $20 service fee, a $15 facility fee, a $7 service fee, all these fees that you don't really understand what you're really paying for, but there's no real choice. And so you're stuck paying a way more inflated price. Similarly, we've heard that when people are going to hotels, uh, when they're you know making everyday purchases, oftentimes there are these junk fees that so show up. In at a the sense, end. false advertising. It's false advertising. People are getting lured by one price, but when they are looking to actually pay, all of these additional fees have been added. Similarly, when people are looking to buy a car, one of the most major purchases that most Americans will make all sorts of times there are these bait and switch tactics. So an auto dealer will advertise one price, but if you go to the lot, are starting to fill out the paperwork, there are all sorts of junk fees added for services that sometimes don't even make sense. So sometimes there will be a fee for nitrogen air in your tires, <laughs> when really it's no different than regular air, or you'll be paying for regular oil changes for electric vehicles. Again, all sorts of charges that sometimes are just for bogus services. And so the FTC has proposed a rule that would ban junk fees, uh, prohibit companies from doing that type of deceptive advertising. Um, there's another issue out there. I bumped into it a few years ago in, uh, when I was dealing with farmers. This is right to repair. Everybody listen up to this one. I, I don't know how many people, I think it's impacted farmers a whole lot others as well, but uh, why don't you talk about what right to repair is about? So right to repair is making sure that once you buy a product, you actually have the freedom to fix that product yourself or to take that product to an independent repair shop. Stop for a second. Not everybody hear that. Generally speaking, when you buy a product, you assume you own the product, right? That's right. And if it breaks down, I will try to get it fixed at a reasonable price, right? That's right. What's going on now? In all sorts of instances, we've seen companies require that if you are looking to get, be it your phone fixed or your tractor fixed, you can only go back to the original manufacturer to get it fixed. And that means there isn't competition for the repair service, and the manufacturer can get away with charging you however much they want. For areas like tractors, this can be really devastating for farmers because they're on the clock, uh, they have a very time sensitive business, and if the manufacturer says, well, I don't have an opening for the repair for several weeks, that means that you can lose your entire crop. Um, I hear from farmers quite regularly about how devastating this has been. But it's not only that, it's, it's, it's monopolistic pricing, isn't it? If I can only go to one guy, he's going to charge me That's right. any price that they can get away with. That's right. And so the FTC has been fighting back. Uh, we've brought a whole set of lawsuits when we believe these repair restrictions are illegal. We've also seen action from states. And so we've gone to testify before state legislatures. We've written letters to provide expertise to states that are making sure Americans can repair their own products. Uh, you, you talked about agricultural equipment. You mentioned phones. How, what's going on in, with cell phones? So phones is another area where we've seen um, manufacturers claim that only they or their authorized dealers can fix your phone. And again, that means consumers end up paying more because there isn't enough options for where they can go to get their phone fixed. And sometimes you hear companies say that if they allow more competition and who can fix your phone, that that'll lead to all sorts of security vulnerabilities or your phone can be more easily hacked. 
And the FTC staff took a lo look at some of these explanations and justifications and determined that in the vast majority of time, they're just not backed up by evidence. And so we worry that companies use some of these arguments as scare tactics to try to dissuade Americans from using independent repair shops, shops that may offer you a cheaper price and instead keep you locked into the more expensive option. All right, we've gone over many issues, but I'm sure you're even doing more. Anything that we didn't discuss that you want to share with the viewers? I mean, across the board, we're really focused on what are the biggest pain points for the American people. Um, as you noted, a major set of pain points is in healthcare. So in addition to some of our orange book work, we've also been taking on illegal mergers. That includes when hospitals are looking to merge. Historically, we've seen that when you see hospital consolidation, too often that results in prices going up, and so Americans have to pay more for hospital stays. And it also can mean that hospitals shut down and there are hospital deserts that are emerging. We've also seen a trend of private equity entering into healthcare. So private equity oftentimes will have an incentive to enter the market, to flip the assets, to strip them, and then to get out and make money off of that transaction, which in practice can mean that all sorts of areas are being financialized in ways that are leaving patients worse off. Just to give you a concrete example, last year the FTC brought a lawsuit against a private equity company that had gone out and bought up all the major anesthesiology providers in Texas. And after they bought them up, they jacked up the price. And so you had Texas patients, Texas businesses paying much more because of these private equity roll-ups. Similarly, we've heard from healthcare workers, including ER doctors, cardiologists, who share that once private equity comes in, they basically overload them, uh, they lay off people, and that leads to a lot of burnout among doctors and makes it much more difficult for them to actually provide quality health care. Are you looking at private equity in general and the role they're playing in every aspect of our economy? I was in Los Angeles uh, last week and private Blackstone buying a lot of homes in America, jacking up prices. Is that something you're looking at? We're certainly interested in these private equity schemes across the board. Healthcare, given that it can be literally life or death for people, is the top of the list. But certainly, you know, we've seen one of the tactics is that there'll be all sorts of stealth acquisitions. So instead of making one huge deal, they'll make a series of smaller deals that will fly under the radar. And so we want to make sure that we're actually getting visibility into that and stopping it when they're rolling up the entire market. All right, what's the politics of this? I am sure that many of these large corporations are less than enthusiastic about the work that you're doing. Fair statement? You know, monopolies have never been fans of enforcing the anti-monopoly laws. And so that type of pushback uh, is something that's in the DNA of taking on monopolies. And so, you know, we're a small agency. We have around 1,200, 1,300 people. Um, but we have a big job. And so we use all of the tools we have, all of the authorities we have to make sure we're fully fighting to protect the American people. Support for antitrust and anti-monopoly is remarkably bipartisan. I mean, historically, we've seen that there is a recognition that when companies get too powerful, uh, when they're not checked by competition, they can get away with mistreating consumers, mistreating workers, with squeezing out businesses and entrepreneurs, and that leaves our communities and the public worse off. Um, all right, we've covered a lot of territory. Anything else on your mind that you want to share? Well, I'll just say, you know, the FTC can only do its work effectively if we're regularly hearing from the American people and the American public. And one of my top priorities has been at the FTC to make sure that people can access us and share with us what are the problems they're facing in their day-to-day -day lives. So how do they do that? So we do regular open commission meetings where anybody can sign up to come talk to the FTC commissioners, tell us what problems are you seeing in the economy. We also regularly collect public comment on online dockets 
Right now, for example, we're seeking public comment on drug shortages that have emerging in all sorts of areas affecting chemotherapy patients, affecting people who rely on essential antibiotics. We're looking for comments for where people are seeing these shortages. So somebody has a concern out there. Yes. How do they get a hold of you? They can go to our website, ftc.gov, uh, and there's a very clear place there where they can submit a comment. There's also a place on our website where you can sign up to come talk to our next commission meeting. Really? Yes. You can verbally talk to the commissioners? Verbally come talk to the commissioners. I mean, we hear from uh, hotel franchisee owners, uh, gig drivers, uh, parents who've lost children because they had to ration their insulin, just people across America who have seen firsthand how problems in our economy can be devastating. And it's just so important for us as FTC commissioners to be understanding where those pain points are so that we can prioritize our work. How many commissioners are there and how do they get appointed? So there are five FTC commissioners. Uh, the president appoints them and the Senate confirms them. All right, we're running out of time. Uh, any last message? Uh, just really eager for the public to share input with us, so please come join our commission meetings and submit public comments to us. And uh, the FTC is, is small, but we really try to punch above our weight and are eager to make <laughs> sure we're fighting for the public. Okay, and you are. So congratulations for doing a great job. And uh, what the chair is telling you, if there are issues out there, consumer issues, worker issues, monopoly issues, she wants to hear from you. So go to your website, contact her, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, and thanks so much for all your terrific leadership. Thank you.